بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا أحمدوه سبحانه وأشكروه وهو أهل الحمد والثناء وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله المصطفى اللهم صل وسلم على عبدك ورسولك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تمسك بسنته إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعد Yesterday we spoke about the importance of the masjid And this is in light and in, of the theme of being Muslim in America Being Muslim in America This is the theme and the title of the lecture But I understand it and look at it more so as surviving in America A Muslim surviving in America Holding on to his deen and safeguarding his deen while living in the land of the kuffar. And no doubt about it, the masjid plays an essential role and is a key component in our survival, in our Islamic survival. Because the masjid is a place where the lessons are taught, where the Muslims come to worship Allah Ta'ala, where the Muslims come to recite from the Book of Allah and learn and study and reflect and the like. So the Masajid, they should be the cornerstones of every Islamic community, of every Muslim community, no matter what state, what, what, what district, what borough, what county, what city, what have you. The Masjid, if, where the, wherever the Muslims are, the masjid should be the cornerstone of their community. And it should be utilized all the time. And it has to be made available so that it may be utilized by the Muslims. By the young, the old, the men, the women, the children, everyone. Now, this is of extreme importance. And one of the benefits... One of the extreme benefits that we get when the masjid is made available and programs are in place and lessons and the like are in place is that we are able to study Allah Ta'ala's book and we're able to study the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is of extreme importance. This is the number one, should be our number one concern. Is the studying, the learning, and the implementing of that which has been revealed. Allah Ta'ala, He says, وَهَذَا كِتَابٌ أَنزَلْنَاهُ مُبَارَكٌ فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَاتَّقُوهُ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ Allah Ta'ala, He says, And this book we have sent it down, a blessed book. So follow it. So follow it. Now, so as to pause in the translation, we won't and we're not going to be able to follow it if we're ignorant of it. If we don't know about it, how are we going to follow it? If we don't know what's in it, how are we going to follow it? If we don't know the commands that are there, how are we going to fulfill them? If we don't know the prohibitions that are there, how are we going to stay away from them? It's not possible. Naam. The verse goes on and it says, وَاتَّقُوا And fear, have fear of Allah Ta'ala. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ So that perhaps you will be shown mercy. So that perhaps you will be shown mercy. Now who from amongst us doesn't want mercy? Living in the dunya and even the best society you're still going to need mercy. Naam. You're still going to be in need of mercy. 
So now, even from this aspect, living in a hectic society that is not built around the remembrance of Allah, no doubt, we need mercy. We need the mercy of Allah Ta'ala. So in light of this, I wanted to share with you a beautiful khutbah. Wa alaykum salam to Allah. That was given by the Fudil to Shaykh Al Alama Shaykh Muhammad Subayyid Hafidullah Ta'ala. If you recall, we heard from his son yesterday, Shaykh Abdul Majid Al Subayyid. Heard from his son yesterday, who was one of the professors at Umukura University. Today we want to read from one of the khutbahs of his father, who was from the Kibaru Ulema. And who was the Imam in the Haram for many years? For many years. Naam. So you want to benefit from his wisdom and his ilm. And we want to reflect. So as we go to the khutbah, I don't want you to just look at it as like, oh, we're hearing something. But I want you to be self reflective. I want you to hear it and reflect on yourselves and your own situations. Because, like we said in yesterday's class, we have to change the way in which we think. We have to rethink and change the way in which we look at our communities and the masjid and its role and our connection to it and everything. I mean, from the way in which we look at a community, so on and so forth, all of that must be changed. Because although we may not realize it, it is broken. Our outlook is broken and is deficient. Now, the way we're living right now is broken, is deficient, and it will only aid in our eventual annihilation. Because, as the ulama point out, and as the historians have pointed out, that never has a Muslim minority resided in the lands of the kuffar, except that within 100 years' time, their offspring become kuffar. They have no more traces of Islam. So it shows you that our situation is not good. And if you look historically, the only societies where the Muslims have thrived in, a non-Muslim society, were societies like China and India. But if you look at the difference between China and India, and for the Muslims who remained in Spain... You see a tremendous difference is what? Is that the Muslims in China and India, they have provinces and areas where it's just Muslim or majority Muslim. So they what? They changed everything. They removed themselves from the society or they isolated themselves so as to what? Protect themselves from the harms of that society. This doesn't mean that they don't interact with the society. They still interact with the society. They still buy and, and trade and sell and things like that. They still interact, they still give down to the best of their ability. But when they go home, they go home amongst themselves. This is a protection. As opposed to the Muslims who were integrated in Spain, now you see them with names like Ali as their surname, Sandra Ali. Right? But they're Kufar, they're Christians. They're Christians. And some may say, well, this is exaggeration. No, it is not. My Spanish teacher in high school, her last name was Ali. And she was Spaniard, originally from Spain. Had no idea or never thought about her lineage. Because from as far as back as she knows, they've all been Christian. As far as back as she knows, they've all been Christian. And I asked her, were they originally Muslims, your family? She said, no, why would you even ask that? I said, because your last name. She said, what about it? I said, that's a Muslim name. But this was to the extent that, yani, you see? So, ala kulli hal, we need to rethink. Uh, we need to rethink. Naam. So, inshallah, let us listen to the ilm of the shaykh, inshallah, and gain some benefit. The shaykh, he says, amma ba'd. Ya ibadullah. He says, O oh, servants of Allah, taqullah, fear Allah Ta'ala. 
Now we're going to say survive in a non-Muslim society. We have to fear Allah. We have to fear Allah no matter where we are. Muslim society, non-Muslim society. We have to fear Allah Ta'ala. فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ حَيْثُ مَا كُنْتُ Fear Allah wherever you at. Naam, wherever you at, fear Allah Ta'ala. وَرَاقَبُوهُ فِي السِّرِّ وَعَلَانِيَةً And know that Allah Ta'ala is watching you. Know that Allah Ta'ala is watching you. Understand this. And let your actions be reflective of this reality in private and in open. In private and in open. Naam. This alone, yani subhanallah, this alone, if we were able to be blessed with this, we'll be safe. We'll be safe. Naam. The Shaykh he says, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ جَلَّ وَعْلَى أَمْدَدَكُمْ بِالنَّعْمَ أَوْ أَمْدَدَكُمْ بِالنَّعْمَ الْوَافِرَةِ لِتَشْكُرُوهُ And know that Allah has bestowed upon you many bounties, a vast amount of bounties, so that you may give thanks to Him. وَجَعْلَ لَكُمْ السَّمْعَ وَالْأَبَصَارِ وَالْأَفْئِدَةِ لِتَتَذَكَّرُوا بِهَا And Allah Ta'ala, He has given you hearing and seeing and hearts and minds for understanding so that you may be reminded about these ni'am. And thus, فَتَعْبُدُوهُ You'll be reminding about these, these bounties and then you will what? You will worship Allah Ta'ala. Now, you will worship Allah Ta'ala. فَإِنَّ مِنْ أَعْظَمِ النَّعْمِ And verily from the greatest of the blessings بَلْ أَعْظَمُهَا عَلَى الْإِطْلَاقِ But rather, not just from the greatest, but the greatest of them. Period. Is what? نَعْمَةُ الْإِسْلَامِ The bounty of Islam. نَعْمَ and I think at times we forget this fact because of the worldly life. Sometimes it deludes us because of chasing after properties and possessions. Sometimes we get deluded and we forget. Sometimes because of a financial uh, strain, we start to feel as if we are worthless. We start to feel bad. We start to feel down. But understand that the Muslim who realizes the bounty of Islam should never feel like this. Whether we have a million dollars or we have a million pieces of lint in our pockets, the, the, the ni'mah of Islam makes you a winner. Because if you had that million dollars, that billion dollars, and you were a kafir, you were a loser. You're going to come in Yawm Al-Akhirah, in Al-Akhirah, Yawm al you're going to come in what? You're going to have nothing. Your abode will be the hellfire forever. Whereas a Muslim who had nothing but Turab, he had nothing but dust, the mu'min, when he meets Allah Ta'ala, he will be happy, and his abode will be the Jannah. How can he ever be a loser? How can you ever be a loser? But at times we forget the bounty of this ni'mah. At times we forget how great this ni'mah is. And at times we forget that without this ni'mah, nothing else matters. If a person is not a Muslim, nothing else matters. No matter how big his car, no matter how nice his house, no matter what universities his children go to and what they accomplish, if a person is not a Muslim, none of that means anything. Because it's not going to avail him. It's not going to avail him when an angel comes for his soul, let alone when he meet his Lord. So it really doesn't matter. But what matters is what? The ni'mah of Islam. This is a bounty and a ni'mah. The Shaykh, he says, Allati la ya'duluha ni'mah. He said, Islam is a blessing that can't no other blessing even compare to. There's nothing of a blessing that is comparable to the Islam. Na'am. Because na'am, it's not cold water from the blessings. Right? The cold spring, fresh water. It's from the blessings, right? That don't compare to the, the ni'mah of Islam. You see? 
Naam, is not having children and all that blessings? Yes, it's a blessing. But it don't compare to the blessing of Islam. It doesn't compare. Naam. And this is what the Shaykh means that this Islam is a blessing that no other blessing can compare to it. No other blessing can compare to it. Naam. He says, Wa Inzal هذا القرآن الكريم على نبيه محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم and also from the bounties is that Allah sent down this Quran upon his prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم this is a ni'ma this is a ni'ma subhanallah never look around and say what you don't have if you have the Mus'haf, if you have the Qur'an, you got so much. You are so rich. Naam. The question is whether or not you're going to tap into that wealth. See, that's the question. It's not going to come to you like money. It don't jump in your pocket. Right? You ever walk down the street and money jump in your pocket? No? Huh? No? I mean, if you did, let me know what corner that was. So I'm going to walk down there too. Inshallah. Now, they don't jump in your pocket. Faith. The Quran is more precious. If dimes and gem don't jump in your pocket, jump in your, you know, safe under the bed and that, why do you think the Quran is going to jump in your head, jump in your heart? No. You got to work hard. You got to work hard. The Shaykh he says, وَقَدْ جَعَلَهُ اللَّهُ نُورًا Allah has made the Quran as a light. تَبَصِرَةً وَتَبِيَانًا لِكُلِ شَيْءٍ to give you guidance and to make clear to you everything, every aspect of your life, it make clear to you. Naam? Every aspect of your life, it make clear to you. Innahu sirat al mustaqim, because it is the straight path. Alladhi, wa dhikr al hakim, yahdi bihi lahu man yasha min ibadi. That it is the reminder. The wise reminder, the reminder of the all wise, who he guides, Allah Ta'ala, he guides whom he pleases from his servants with it, with the Quran. And by way of it, he leads astray whom he pleases. But understand, that Allah, he only leads astray who? The criminals, the corrupted ones, the filthy hearted individuals. These are the only ones. Who get led astray. Why? Because they didn't want guidance. So no guidance was given to them. And this is what they say. Jazat min jinsan amal. Person he wants to be a fasiq. He wants to go outside. He wants to transgress the bounds. He wants to worship other than Allah. He wants to disbelieve in Allah. He wants to disbelieve in the Prophet wasallam. He wants to turn away. Turn his back on the guidance. Thus he won't be guided. You see? Because that's what he get. Jazat min jinsan amal. So the so the punishment fits the crime. The punishment fits the crime. He don't want guidance. He don't get guided. You see? Now, the Shaykh he says, "Ibad Allah, Inna kathira min al nas al yom lam yagrifu qadr al hadi al nima hadi al nima, bal aaradu an kitab Allah." He said, Oh, servants of Allah, verily many people today, they don't know the magnitude of this bounty. Rather, they even go as far as to turn away from the book of Allah. And this is important to know how in which they're turning away from the book of Allah. Naam. And in turning away from the book of Allah, by default, they will also turn away from what? The sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Because the two go together. Naam. Allah ta'ala in the Quran commands us to adorn ourselves and to live our lives by the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Allah ta'ala in the Quran commands us to obey the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah ta'ala in the Quran, he commands us to follow the way of the salaf. So if you turn your back on the Quran, you turn your back on all that. So there's, there, there could be no good you can ever achieve, ever. If you turn your back on the Quran, the attainment of good will be out of your reach. You will never be able to attain it. 
But let us look now because some people they have an understanding when you say turn away from the Quran, certain things come to their mind. That may not include all of what is intended and all of what is meant by turning away from the Quran. The Shaykh, he says, they turn away from it. They turn away from its commands and its prohibitions. They turn away from its commands and its prohibitions. Meaning what? They turn away from the commands that they don't fulfill them. They turn away from the prohibitions because they don't stay away from them. You see? So it's not enough just that you read the Quran. Because somebody may say, well, I read the Quran daily. Wait, you can read the Qur'an daily and still at the same time be turned away from it. So this is what's important to understand. It's not just you don't read it. But then you have what's even compounded is those, <laughs> is that those who what? Who don't fulfill His commands, they don't stay away from His prohibitions, and then they don't read it neither. Subhanallah. Naam. Definitely, to survive anywhere in the earth and especially in a Kafir society you need not do this you need not turn away from the book of Allah Ta'ala and then the shaykh he goes on because somebody may say but you know I try my best I, I, I do what's you know I do what it commands me to do and I stay away from the from the haram now they say so I'm good right no nah. Not, not, not yet. Got to do some more stuff. The Shaykh he says, "A'radu an ta'alumihi wa ta'alimi." He said, and then others what? They also they turn away from learning it and from studying it. You see, they turn away from learning it and from studying it. So it's important that we have to learn and we have to study, and all of these are interconnected. Because someone says, we say, quote unquote, for argument's sake, they say, but I, I fulfill the commands and, you know, I stay away from the prohibitions. Play it. But in reality, can you really do that efficiently if you don't know what's in the Quran, if you don't study it? How can you really do it real for real? You can't. So the two are coupled. So in order to really, in reality, fulfill his commands and stay away from his prohibitions, you have to study it and learn it. And this is why. This could be like a homework now, or you know, that you take with you to study. Look through the biographies of the Sahaba. Right? And then look through the biographies of the Tabi'een. And then Atba Tabi'een and the Imma who follow them in Ihsan. And you will find one thing in common is what? Is they all spent their lives studying and contemplating over the Quran. Even though they memorized it, a lot of them, in their youth. You will find throughout the rest of their lives, they were constantly studying and contemplating and studying and studying the Quran. Now, constantly. You will find this as, as, a, as a standard amongst all the righteous ones. You will find this a standard amongst them. Now, and also what? Teaching it. Well, I check. If you don't learn it, then you know, you, your door is closed on teaching because it's the one who's deprived of something, he can't give it. Naam. So if you don't know it, you can't teach it. Naam. But all of these things coincide with what? Turning away from the Quran. So now when I say you have to be self-reflective now, look at our situations. Okay? Some of us, alhamdulillah, we've been blessed. And a lot of times I don't think we realize to the magnitude of the blessing that we have. Is that we live in a community where we have a strong Quran program. It's not to say there's not room for improvement. There's always room for improvement, right? But still, be thankful for what you have. Right? So for you brothers now, I don't want you to say, well, I'm good. No, no. There's always room for improvement. Think to make it better. Now, but now to the other brother, look now and see. All of the communities in which we live in, do they have the facilities and the programs by way of which we can learn the Qur'an. If the answer is no, then this is what? This is something that has to be worked on. This is a deficiency. This is a deficiency. Because people may come and say, well, I want to learn the Qur'an now. And they go to the masjid, and, hey, I want to learn the Qur'an. It's nothing for them to learn the Qur'an. I want my children to learn the Qur'an, but it's nothing for them to learn the Qur'an. So this is a deficiency that must be rectified.
We can't leave it like that. Not if we're going to survive here. We can't leave it like that. We can't leave it like that. Because that won't work if you're in Mecca. Right? That won't work if you're in Mecca. If you turn your back on the Quran, you're going to go straight even in Mecca. Okay? So if it don't work in Mecca, how do you think it's going to work in Manhattan? How is it going to work in Marietta? How is it going to work in Miami? How is it going to work in Minnesota? It's not going to work. So that, if we don't have it, we got to change it. Period. That, we don't got it, we got to change it. Now you may say, but we don't have people who are there who teach us the Quran. Okay? Now you have to have long-sightedness. Don't be short-sighted. Have long-sightedness. We got a bunch of youth, right? Maybe some of them will want to go to Sardinia. Go to Medina. Go to Umqura. Ma'am. Maybe those who don't get accepted there, they may go to Egypt, sit with the Mashaykh. The Salafi Mashaykh. Sheikh Hassan, Abdul Hab al-Banna, Sheikh Khalid bin Uthman, Sheikh Khalid bin Abdul Rahman, Sheikh Muhammad Raslan. Ma'am, sit with the Mashaykh. Those who aren't youth, because if you're not youth, then you know you're not going to go to Saudi here because they have an age limit. Okay? And the age limit ain't for old people. It's only 25. So you still be a youth, but you ain't young enough. Okay? But Egypt is open. Still go study. Somebody can be 80. Still go study. Lab us. The point is, be long, be, have, have long vision. So if you say, we don't have nobody right now, lab us. But we got a few dollars. And this guy really wants to learn. So we're going to send you to go learn it. We're going to pay for you. Why? Because now in five, this is an investment now. In five years time, inshallah, you'll come back and now we got teachers. You know? But because what? Because we don't know what Allah Ta'ala has in store for anyone. And we don't want to hold nobody back. What I mean by that? I mean that we may send someone and he may die. Okay? Or we may send someone and he may get an opportunity to go work or live in Sardinia. Or, 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 or to stay in Egypt for the rest of his life. So we wanna, we're not going to hold nobody back from the, from the khair. So we want to be able to say, okay, no, la best, don't worry about it. Whatever we gave you, we're going to see it anyway. So don't worry about it, stay there. Right? So with that being the case, you have to do what? We have to send more than one person. Because if we send 10 and 5, 50% of them come back, alhamdulillah, that's good. But we have to start thinking along these terms now. We can't think in, 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 in weeks and months, but we have to think in years and decades, inshallah ta'ala. Naam? Khair. The Shaykh goes on, he says, A'radu an talawati He said that they turn away from reciting it, and they turn away from reflecting upon it. Naam? The Shaykh, he says, A'radu an al-amil bih, and they turn away from acting in accordance to it. وَأَعْرَضُوا عَنْ تَحَاكُمْ إِلَيْهِ وَتَحْكِيمِهِ And they turn away from utilizing it to, 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 to judge their lives and likewise ruling by way of it. The Shaykh, he brings an ayah that I want everyone to reflect on. And I don't want anyone in here to hear this ayah and to look at his brother. I don't want anyone in here to hear this ayah and for her, for her to look at her sister. Right? In other words, I want anybody here to hear this ayah and say, oh, that sounds like her. Oh, that sounds like him. Now, I want you to hear this ayah and I want you to think about yourselves. I want you to see, interrogate yourself. Does that sound like you? That's what I want you to say. Does this sound like me? Right? Allah Ta'ala, He says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Allah Ta'ala says, Do they not reflect on the Qur'an? Or are their hearts locked up? Do they not reflect on the Qur'an? Do they not contemplate on the Qur'an? Or are their hearts locked up? Reflecting and contemplating on the Quran, what? So that it affects you. You become affected by it. It changes you. 
it alters you or are you, or is your heart locked up that when you read it it rattles you you come to tears or is your heart locked up that when you come across his commands the urge and desire that's within you to fulfill them is overwhelming and if that's not the case is your heart locked up when you come across his prohibitions is the urge and desire to stay away from it overwhelming or is your heart locked up these are answers that everyone has to answer for his or her self but I want you to reflect on that because if your heart is locked up you're not going to survive living anywhere let alone a Kafir society the Sheikh he goes on and he says in the i'rab an kitab Allah دليل على ضعف ضعف الإيمان. He said that verily, turning away from the book of Allah is a proof to the weakness of, of your faith, to the weakness of faith. Only a weak faith individual will turn away from the Quran. Now everybody knows the answer. When's the last time you read the Quran? When's the last time you contemplated on the Quran? Everybody knows the answer to that. Now. And unfortunately, everybody knows the answer. Was the last time, sisters, you read a soap magazine or you read a, a, a one of them stupid novels? It's not real. Why would you waste your time with that? Leave that stuff alone. It's garbage. Nah. But it's a travesty. You have people that are read a 500-page nonfiction thing, and and and, and it ain't even read a surah and Allahu Alam. Allah Mustaan. The Sheikh he says, and this is a dalil ala nuqsan al aql. Allah Musta'an. The Shaykh he says, and this is a proof to the deficiency in one's brain, of deficiency in the intellect. You know, the aql is something that's supposed to restrain you from something. The aql yeah, is something that should restrain you from harming yourself. So when you go and do these things by turning away from the Quran, that's what gonna hurt you. So this shows a deficiency in your aql, a deficiency in your intellect. The Shaykh he says, وَدَلِيلُ عَلَى فَسَادِ tasawwur," And this also is a proof which shows the corruptedness of his outside. وَدَلِيلُ عَلَى الدَّعْفِ بَصِيرًا And also is a, is a dalil on the weakness of his insight. وَدَلِيلُ عَلَى And this is what we really need to be careful وَدَلِيلُ عَلَى قَسَاوَةُ الْقَلْبِ And it's a proof of the hardness of your heart. That the heart is hard. That the heart is what? It's locked up. Now, And you have to understand the heart, when it means it gets locked up. They say, رَانَ عَلَى قُلُوبِهِمْ When the rana comes on the qalb, when the, when the screen comes on the qalb, this is the end of the affair. They don't start like that. The lock don't come on the heart from the beginning. The lock comes on the heart at the end. The Salaf they used to say when explaining this ayah, they say is 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 as if you took the fingers of your hand, right? Because the rana it comes what when you do a sin. When you do a sin, the black dot comes. If you make the tawbah, it goes away. Okay? They say, but if you do a sin. It's like a finger, in, without toba, it's like a finger closed. You do some more sins, another finger. Some more sins, another finger. Some more sins, another finger. Some more sins, all of which with no toba, then the heart is locked. Like the fist. What does it mean when it's locked? It means it's locked because it's filled up with what? With evil. So it's locked, so none of that evil can get out. And it's locked, it has no good in it. But because it's locked, can't no good get in. And this is why the ulama, they say that when a rana comes on the qalb, a person does not know the difference between right and wrong. They can't differentiate. To them, telling the truth and telling a lie is the same thing. They don't know. They don't feel the difference. Being righteous and being evil is the same. They don't know. They don't know what's good, what's wrong. Because of all this sin, it has closed their heart. Closed their heart. Naam. So this is, this is, yani, this, this is something we need to be worried about. Because when the heart gets closed like that, it's because what? It's hard. It becomes hardened. It becomes like a rock. Now, 
So this is, yani, the shaykh says also is the lead or ala tool in amal. It's also a proof when they turn away from the Quran that they have been deluded and thinking they have a long time. Because this is a problem. People thinking that they have a long time. And the ulama from the past, from them, Ibn Abi uh, Dunya, he wrote a beautiful book on this issue of not thinking you got such a long time. Now, taking advantage of, of, of now, living for the akhirah like you're going to die today. But when it comes for the dunya, yeah, and you put it off and do that tomorrow. You know, when, when it comes for the dunya, what do they say? Why do the day? Well, we can postpone to tomorrow. When it comes to the akhirah, we got to do it now. I might not be here tomorrow. As far as the dunya, hey, if I don't pay the internet bill and I die, <laughs> not much. I ain't going to be surfing the web from my grave. Right? But, I want to read this surah. I want to do this one of that. I need to do it now. Why? Because that's going to help me in the akhirah. That's more good deeds for me. So if I got a choice between I'm going to do this now or I'll do that tomorrow, well, I'll pay the bill tomorrow. Let me read this Quran today. Nah. And like that. I mean, it's not in the same time when I use this as an excuse that I need to be negligent. La la. La la. Don't be negligent. Take care of your business. But don't forget about your akhirah. The Shaykh, he says, and this is also a sign that these individuals, they have turned away and they're neglectful. They're neglectful about the one who has fashioned the earth and the skies. Meaning Allah Ta'ala, that they're neglectful of their Lord. When you turn away from the Quran, you're neglectful from your Lord. The ulama, they said, Ashaykh Luhaydan, he said in one of his classes before Ramadan, beautiful statement. He said, if you want, and the ulama from the Salaf, they used to say this as well. They said, if you want Allah to speak to you, then read the Quran. Because the Quran is the speech of Allah and is not created. Allah Ta'ala, he says, about those ones who have become deceived by the dunya, thinking they have a lot of time and it is playing around. Allah Ta'ala, He says, ذَرْهُمْ يَأْكُلُوا وَيَتَمَتَّعُوا وَيُلْهِهِمُ الْأَمْنُ فَسَوْفَ يَعْلَمُونَ Allah Ta'ala, He says, And leave them to eat and enjoy and let them be preoccupied with false hope. They'll come to know. They'll come to know. Naam. When you hear stuff like this from Allah Ta'ala, فَسَوْفَ يَعْلَمُونَ this this is enough to make the one who's reflective faint. Because verily, you don't want to know what they're going to come to know. Okay? You don't want to know what they're going to come to know. The Shaykh, he says, Inna Allah a'taba ibadahu al-mu'mineen Verily, Allah has censored His believing servants. وَحَثَّهُمْ عَلَى خَشْيَتِهِ and he has encouraged them to be fearful of him. And he has warned them to not resemble and imitate the people of the book who have turned away from his book. And they turned away from acting in accordance to the revelation. And if not, then they will be like them, having hard hearts. Allah Ta'ala, He says, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِ فَطَالَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَمَلُ فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَكَثِيرٌ مِنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ You see that word again? فاسقون. Allah Ta'ala, He says what means Has not the time come? Has not yet the time come? That those who believe 
will become moved and affected and will be fearful their hearts will be fearful by the remembrance of Allah that they will be moved and affected and their hearts will be fearful by the remembrance of Allah that it will change their lives this is what this means that it will change their lives if there were any deficiencies any things they weren't doing when they come across these ayat which made clear to them then that's it they changed their life changed now Allah Musta'an. It comes to mind one of the Sahabi. Prior to his accepting Islam, he listened to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recite Surah Al Tur in Maghrib. And he said it was never a recitation that he ever heard better than the recitation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said that he listened, and at the time he was listening, he was still before Islam. He was still a polytheist at that time. Naam. He said that when the Prophet ﷺ came to the ayah, أَمْ خُلِقُوا مِنْ غَيْرِ شَيْءٍ أَمْ هُمُ الْخَالِقُونَ Which means, or, or, or did they, or were they created from nothing? Or did they create themselves? Right? Because there are only three options in, in this issue. Either we were created from nothing, everything created from nothing, and we know this is not, what, plausible. Or, we all created ourselves, and we know this is not true. So the only option, which is the third possibility is what? Is that we have a creator who created us and fashioned us, is that Allah created us. This is the only option, Allah created us. He says, so when he heard this ayah, and the point I want to make here is, I want you to ask yourself now, reflect on yourself. Have I ever had a moment in my life like that? Since I've been Muslim, have I ever had a moment in my life like that? He said, when he heard that ayah, he said, Ya wa qalbi an yatir. He said, my heart almost flew out my chest. When he just when he heard that one ayah, he said, My heart almost flew out my chest. And he immediately went and accepted Islam. Immediately. So now we've been Muslim all this time. Every Ramadan come and read the Quran. Have you ever had a moment like that that feel like your heart about to fly out your chest? Because you're so affected by the book of Allah. If this is not the case, then we have to fear for ourselves that maybe perhaps our hearts are hardened. Allah Ta'ala, he goes on and says in his ayah that they become moved, has not yet the time come that they'll be moved by the remembrance of Allah and by that which has been revealed from the haqq. Allah Ta'ala says, and do not be like those who came before. Wala yakunu, do not be like those who came before. From those who were given the book. And then the term was prolonged for them. The term was prolonged for them. They got deluded. And then their hearts became hard. Then their hearts became hardened. And many of them were disbelieving criminals. Now, because this is what happens when we turn away from the book of Allah Ta'ala. And for those who are struggling now because the shaitan he comes to some especially the non-Arab and the young who are learning who are learning and he'll try to discourage you he'll say look you see how long it took you to read that 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 that, that, that surah you see how much mistakes you're making you might as well just stop you might as well just don't even continue just leave it See, the shaitan, he comes in with this trick. You see? The reality of it is, ya, ya ikhwa, wa akhawat, the only way you're going to recite the Quran better is by to keep reciting it, the struggle. Okay? It's the only way. There's no, there's no trick. There's no secret to it. The only way to get better is that you have to keep doing it. Imam al-Shatabi, he says, and, 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 and the, constant re, the constant repeating of it, na'am, 
it, it increases يعني تستادو يعني تجمل it increases its beauty the more you recite it the better you recite it the more you recite the better you recite this is the reality now but for those who recite and, and it's difficult for them the shaykh he brings a reminder now he says and it comes in Sahih Bukhari wa ibn Majah from the hadith of our mother Aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha qalat she said قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم the Prophet ﷺ he said الماهر بالقرآن مع سفرة الكرام البررة that the one who recites the Quran really really good then he's like يعني, you know he'll be with like the angels now, that's what this means he'll be like with the angels right this for the one who recites it good okay والذي يقرأ القرآن and the one who recites the Quran but he's like what? He's he keep repeating, he keeps stuttering, he keep messing up, he's starting going back, starting going back, starting going back. Meaning like a word, not like a sort of, but like a word. This is to the point where he's struggling. He'll start to read and then he gotta go back. Then he read, then he gotta go back, because he's struggling with it. Right? And it's difficult for him. So he's reading the Quran, he's 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 stuttering, he's repeating, he's going back. It's hard. It's a hard time for him. He's having a hard time. Guess what? Lahu ajran. He get two rewards. Multiply double. Now this is, in, this is in light of what? That whoever reads the Quran, then what? He gets, يعني, uh, he gets ten blessings for every letter. Right? Right? You with me? And this is from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said that Whoever من قرأ الحرف من كتاب الله whoever reads a, a, a letter from the book of Allah فله حسنة then he will have a good deed والحسنة بعشر أمثالها but the good deed is by what ten multiply ten tenfold multiply by ten alright right then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he made it clear he said لا أقول ألف لام ميم حرف I'm not saying that ألف لام ميم is a حرف نعم he said ولكن ألف Harf. Alif is a harf. With lam, harf. And lam is a harf. With meme, harf. And meme is a harf. So alif, lam, meme, 30 good deeds. At least. At least 30 good deeds. At least 30 good deeds. At least. Now, because we know that the what? That the, that the good deeds are multiplied from ashara to what? Sab'amiya da'fan. From ashara to 700 times multiplied. So we say at least, at least, Ibn Abbas, عنه, we said that the 10 is for every believer from the gate. That's the given. 10. That's the default number. These, it multiplied by 10. Every believer get that. He said, and then depending on the person's iman, ikhlas, and the like, then it gets multiplied more, 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 more to 700. Now, the one who recites the Quran, and as the Prophet said, he said, and he's re- re- struggling. Who Ali Shaqun in his heart for him? He gets double the reward. So I don't even try to contemplate what that is. My calculator don't even work like that. Now that's subhanallah. So is it an encouragement what? To read the Quran. Now is it an extreme encouragement to read from the Quran and to memorize from it? And there are many a hadith which come bearing this meaning of the reciting of the Quran and reading of the Quran and things like this. There are many a hadith that come like this. And there are many a hadith that come for those who have memorized something from the Quran and are trying to memorize it to constantly review it and go over it. Like the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where he says, "This is from the hadith of Abu Musa, رضي الله تعالى عنه, and collected by Bukhari and Muslim." The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "Ta'ahadu." Al-Quran. Yani constantly recite and go over and, and study and review the Quran. For what levi nafsi biyadi. But for by the one who my soul is in his hands. Lahuwa ashaddu. Tafassiyan min al-ibri fi uqliha. He said that by the one who my soul is in his hands, verily the Quran, it'll get away from you quicker than the camel that's tied. Huh? And you see the beautiful of the Arab, the beauty of the Arabic language, right? Fi'uqliha. Uqliha. Naam. 
and that, and the uqal is what is 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 the jama of uh, of iqal. Iqal is that is that rope that you tie the the, the, foot, the legs of the camel with to keep it tied down, right? Uqaliha. Don't that sound like another word we just was talking about? Al aqal. From the same same root. The same root, right? Because the aqal, like how they say yani aqala and the aqlun, uqulun, the jama, uqulun. Now I'm you say aqila, ya aqilu, aqlan. Naam is a tasrif. Ma'qulan, yani for those who want that. For who are aqil, min al uqala. Naam, this is for the ones studying Arabic. I ain't gonna try to translate it. Anyway, the aqil is, is what? Is, it should be that which restrains you, ties you down, restrains you from hurting yourself, restrains you from destroying yourself. So you find this word. Now, it's like the what? The, it, it, it get away quicker than a camel who's tied up. Because a camel who's tied up is tied up, because why? Because if he ain't tied up, he's gonna run away. Right? If you don't tie it good enough, what's gonna happen? You're gonna come back and he ain't gonna be there. He's gonna be gone. You see? So likewise, you have to study a lot and memorize and, and, and review much the Quran. Because look, you need the Quran. The Quran don't need you. Okay? And if you're neglectful of the Quran, the Quran will leave you. The Salaf, they bring a narration that should scare everybody. There was an individual who was a half of the, of the Quran. But then he got overtaken by neglect. Overtaken by sins and, and you know and the like. They said so much so that he would walk by people praying. And he would hear them recite Fatiha. And he would say, I used to know that surah. That's what he would say. He said, I used to know that surah. That sounds familiar. I used to know that. This is the reality. We need the Quran. The Quran don't need us. We need the Quran. The Quran don't need us. If we turn our backs on it, it leave. That's it. Now. So, ala kulli hal, when we see the importance of how we need the Quran, let's another. Let me bring another narration from Ibn Umajah, from the Hadith of Anas, radiallahu taala anhu, that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "Inna lillahi ahlain." That Allah taala he has, yani inna lillahi ahlain min al-nas. That Allah he has people from, yani from, uh, how would you say, like chosen ones and from the people. Naam wa khasatu. Allah has special chosen ones from human beings. Right? Now, the Prophet Wasallam, from his, his, his excellent teaching method, he would say things like that and stop. Because just by hearing that alone, what does it do? It makes, it, yani, you become, your attention is there. And you start to get real hungry. Because now you're like, who are they? Allah has special ones, chosen ones from the human beings. And then he stopped. So now everybody's, their attention is there. They, they, they're on the edge. Edge of their seat. Who, who? So they said, Man hum ya Rasulullah. Who are they? Who, who, who are these ones? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ahlul Quran. Hum ahlullah wa khasatu. The people of the Quran. They are the special chosen ones by Allah. The people of the Quran. Now, now, can you be a person of the Quran and you turn your back on the Sunnah? No. You turn your back on the Sunnah, you're not even being the Quran. Eh? So when he say the people of the Quran, do you know what? The people of the Quran and the Sunnah. Naam. Ahlul Sunnah and wal Jama'ah. Naam. The Salafiyun. Athiriyun. Right? I can't say it more clearly than that, right? Naam. Alhamdulillah. Bye. And a, a, an important key component in us treating the Quran as it should be treated and what help us in the study of the Quran is that we have to have places, masajid, where we can go to pray, to study, to learn, to have classes. And to contemplate over the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. 
This is why the masjid is important. This is why the masjid is important. And this is why we have to strive as men to establish the masjid. We have to strive as men to establish the masjid from the giving of our wealth and our time and our efforts. Likewise from the sisters they have to strive. And this is important because of the key role the masjid plays. And it plays a role that's greater than the role of your house. It plays a role that's greater than the role of your house. Right? Now, I'm not saying that, you know, go live in a box and that. No, I'm not saying that. So keep it, you know, anybody saying go pay your, don't pay your rent and like that. I'm not saying that. You got to do what you got to do. You got to take care of what you got to take care of because you have responsibilities. And Allah is made binding on you men, on us men, right? But, but understand the role of the masjid. Because sometimes, unfortunately, you know, people have some messed up thinking. When the masjid is saying we need to baru'at, we need charity, so we can you know, pay the rent, pay the bills, you know, so on and so forth. So we can have a masjid. Sometimes people in their stingy, pig headed. There's a lot of other words I want to say. Well, I won't, but I think you get it. Them ways. Person had the nerve to say, What am I getting money to the masjid for? Shoot, I need money. Give me money. Billah. We don't establish a salah in your house. We don't have class in your house. But this is a problem. People look at the masjid like it's a cash cow. Y'all give me money. You see? It is time that the men support the da'wah. And stop trying to use the da'wah to support them. Okay? This is time the men have to support the da'wah. And stop trying to use the da'wah to support them. So don't look at the masjid except of how I can give and get khair. And we all know that we have extra money. Right? We all know we got extra money. If we go in your cabinets, we'll see Chips Ahoy's and Cinnabons and right Hershey's and all that. You ain't got to eat that. You ain't got to eat to that extent. You might got like five things. You know what I mean? Yeah. You don't need all that. Buy two. Give money to the masjid. Okay? Cut back fast. Mondays and Thursdays. Give your lunch money to the masjid. Don't look at it like it's little. Because you, you're doing it for yourself. You're putting it forward for yourself. For and, and fear the fire, even if with just yani, the, the, uh, the skin of the date. Even if it's with a half of a date. So don't look at it like that. It's just what? You want to give khay, you want to give khay for yourself. There's more that you'll see from good deeds, inshallah. Nah. But it's important that the masters are, are here. Because no doubt, things get rough sometimes. Things get tough. Sometimes you need a break. You know the kufar, they say, I'm going to take a vacation. I'm going to go to Jamaica. I'm going to go to Hawaii. I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to go like this. So I take a break. As a Muslim, alhamdulillah, these things are halal. If you want to do it, fine. Just don't indulge in no haram stuff. Right? Not but you know what? We don't need it to this extent. Why? Because we get breaks. Daily, we get breaks. In the masjid. This is what we need. We need a masjid. Huh? We, there's so if we had to make a list of why we need a masjid, right? Of course, at the top would be what to establish the salah, the obligations that Allah has put on us, and you'll start going down that list of why you need a masjid. Somewhere on that list will be for your mental sanity. For your mental sanity, we need the masjid. Really, check it out. The Prophet said, "He said, 'Mashtama qawmin fi baytin min biyutillah.'" يتنون كتاب الله ويتدرسونه فيما بينهم إلا نزلت عليهم السكينة وغشيتهم الرحمة وحفتهم الملائكة وذكرهم الله في من عنده 
This right here, subhanAllah. The Prophet ﷺ said, Never has a people come together in a house from the houses of Allah, reciting therein the book of Allah, and studying it amongst themselves, except that the sakina, the tranquility comes down on them. Who don't need that tranquility? All this foolishness, all this hecticness we deal with on a day-to-day basis, who don't need that tranquility? Nah. And it shows you too how the shaitan plays us. Every day he plays us. We get to the masjid and he's still playing us. Nah. Because look, and I'm being honest with you. Alhamdulillah. And this may not be the most popular statement. So I'm sorry if you get offended. But alhamdulillah, we have conferences. Alhamdulillah. La bas, they have some good in it. But really, me personally, I don't like them. Regular classes are much more beneficial. Because what happens? What happens? What happens you come to the conference and almost every conference we get what? Notes coming, sisters, please be quiet. Right? Because it becomes a social event. When people come to the masjid and they got on the illest thawb, niqab, jilbab, whatever they got. The best thing they got is a fashion show. They don't come with a pen and a paper. But they come decked out. They don't come to listen to the rules, but they come to talk amongst themselves. And they talk so much so that those who want to benefit can't even hear. Really. They talk so much so sometimes. That there be women who come with their fashion show stuff who are not praying. And then they go have the nerve to talk so much that the people in the salah who's praying, the women who's praying in the salah, can barely hear the imam over the speaker because they're talking so much. Yes, salam. The message is not for that. It's not for a fashion show. It's not for you to come and talk about this and that, that, and that. The Prophet is explaining to us the purpose of the masjid. And the Prophet he explains to us what we get when we utilize it correctly. We come, we read from the book of Allah. We study the book of Allah amongst ourselves. What happens? The tranquility comes upon you. The rahmah, you become encircled in rahmah. The angels encircle you. And the best of all of them, the best of all of them, which if ain't none of that other stuff happen, this is enough for us, is that Allah mentions you with those who are with Him. That's the best. That Allah Ta'ala mentions you with those who are with Him. That's the best. But we get that and more. The tranquility, the rahmah, subhanAllah. And then we wonder why our, our, our lives are all over the place. It's so chaotic. Our life is hectic. We're dealing with hectic stuff. Our kids is hectic. This is hectic. We come to the masjid and we acting all crazy, talking, this and that. The, the class is going on and we speaking over the ayat. We speaking over the ahadith. We speaking over even the salah. The darus is going on. We in the sukh. Subhanallah. Hectic. Everything hectic. And we wonder why life is more hectic. Why I don't get a break? You don't get a break because you don't deserve a break. You're a problem. Why you got all this mashakir? Because you's a mushkil. He a mushkila. You got all these problems because you're a problem. Ain't she a problem? That's why you got these problems. What do you expect? Jazat? I mean, just I mean, you're a problem. So you got a lot of problems. Now I'm... As opposed to acting in a co- correct way, a correct manner, that you come to the masjid and you study from the book of Allah. Yeah, you got problems. Your boss cussed you out. He made you feel little. He and he, all this. You, you, your co-workers, y'all arguing. You get this. The kids running around me. You come to the masjid. You read the Quran. The tranquility. You're in the class. The tranquility. The rahmah. Angels. Circling. Huh? Allah Ta'ala mentions you with those who are with them. This is from the benefit of studying. You study and you contemplate. You're in so much in the class. 
that you haven't even thought about them bills you ain't paid. You haven't even thought about them breaks is, is starting to grind. You haven't even thought about the argument you and your coworker had because of whatever. It ain't even come across your mind. That's the first thing from your mind because you get, now you're getting a break. So you need the master for your mental stability, for your sanity. These are from the benefits of why we need the masajid. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Quran wa allama. And the best of you are those who learn the Quran and teach it. The best of you are those who learn the Quran and teach it. So we should all be striving hard to want to learn the Quran and to set up institutions. And listen, I don't want no one to come and say, I want to learn the Quran. But you know what? The masjid, man, ain't got no program. So you know what you do? Ah, be a part of establishing a program. You be a part of establishing a program. And then you say, but ah, you know what? I, I, don't, I, I need to learn. I'm, I can't teach. Don't teach. You got some money. Get your money. Help establish it. You have know-how. You're not stupid. Help arrange it. Help organize it. You see? Be a part of it. Volunteer your time. When the children come to learn, be a volunteer. See, I, I watch them when they eat lunch and make sure they're not, you know, they're keeping good behavior and stuff like that. You can do that, right? We get money. Income tax is coming. Can't tell me you can't break some of that. You ain't even expecting it. So right from the top, say, look, $500 for a Quran program. Everybody did that? Well, have a, might have a, another, sure. Build a, build a, build a for a Quran, yeah? Program. But we have to start looking like this, thinking like that. Because when you do things like that, you're the first one to benefit. Because now whatever you gave, Fisa Bilal, whatever time that you offered, Fisa Bilal volunteered, you're going to see that with Allah Ta'ala. Benefit. You got kids, kids benefit. You got a wife, she goes, she learns, she benefit. You go, you learn, you benefit. You win. It's a win-win situation. You win every way. You win. It's a win-win situation. Now, so let us take advantage of it, inshallah ta'ala. Let us rethink. Let us reflect in light of this beautiful, beautiful advice from the Sheikh. This beautiful khutbah that he gave. Let us reflect on the jewels that he brought therein. And let us take from this and apply it, inshallah ta'ala, in our communities and in our lives, inshallah ta'ala, and to benefit bi ithnillahi ta'ala. Wa naktafi bi hadhal qadr. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.